asking. Okay, and we're live. So hello everyone. Um, this is an OAuth talk on HP3. Uh, so with us uh, is Robin Marx, um, who will go through um, some of the security implications of HP3, and more importantly, what is HP3? So Mark, would you like to tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, so hello everyone, I'm Robin. Um, I've been a PhD student for the past couple of years, and now I'm a postdoctoral researcher, and I have done research into HTTP2 and HTTP3 and QUIC, obviously. I'm not a ex uh, security expert, though. I've mostly looked at the uh, uh, performance aspects of these protocols, but doing that, you come into contact with a lot of security aspects as well. So uh, I should be able to talk uh, <laughs> enough about that to make it interesting uh, and hopefully not make too many mistakes to the deep uh, technical security stuff. Yeah. No problem. And thank you very much, uh, Robin, for coming. And this is one of the other reasons why we invited you is to actually have non-security people to come in and, and talk for, for us to learn from each other as well. So thank you. Uh, yeah, and if you would like, um, feel free to share your screen if you'd like to present and talk. Uh, just an FYI for those who are uh, hearing, um, we might go through, we, this might be on uh, the OWASP podcast, so um, there is a video for this, um, but uh, also we'll try to talk through this as much as possible so that you won't be missing out uh, as much as well. So um, I have this slide deck uh, with a lot of interesting diagrams and some links. Uh, I'm sure this will be shared somehow in combination with the video or the, or the audio as well. So you can look back at this afterwards um, if you if you can't see it or uh, or want to look at things a bit more clearly. So uh, yeah, um, I think the idea was that I would introduce TCP uh, HTTP three a little bit first, right? Um, yeah. Not assuming that people already know exactly what that is. So um, basically, HTTP3 is um, very, very similar to HTTP2, uh, at least at the HTTP layer. They're very similar in concept and features, uh, what they offer. What is actually very, very different is the layer below. The, the reason we need HTTP3 um, is not so much that HTTP2 is outdated, but more that TCP and TLS combined, that part of the stack, that was kind of getting outdated. And that has now been replaced with a new transport layer uh, protocol, or I should maybe say a, a new protocol that spans multiple layers because it has a little bit of the transport layer and what you might call the security layer, and then also a little bit of the application layer all built into one package. And that is of course, uh, that is of course called the Quick protocol. Uh, and so quick um, is, is sometimes called CCP 2.0, right? Because in, in very much ways, it's basically what you would say if we started TCP today from scratch, but taking uh, all the best practices that we know from the past 30 years, let's say from TCP, combine all of that into one package, be a little bit more clever about how we do some things, and then taking that, and integrating TLS uh, 1.3 very deeply with TCP. So if you can watch the schema, you will see that, uh, or, or you of course know that TLS and TCP are fully separate. You can run unencrypted protocols directly over TCP, obviously, but you can also use TLS as a an, as an layer in between to, uh, for example, encrypt HTTP. With Quick, this is fully integrated. So there is currently no way to run quick unencrypted. TLS is very deeply integrated uh, into that. And if we have a little bit more detail later on, you'll, you'll see how much that actually changes things uh, in practice. But so the thing is that um, we wanted to replace TCP and TLS with quick for several reasons. Um, and then we tried very hard to just run HTTP2 on top of quick. That was the original intent. But quick changes just enough, to, or should I say, just a little bit too much of the underlying protocol that that would be very uh, annoying, very difficult to get right. It's theoretically possible, but it's not very uh, nice to implement. And so 
what they basically did is make an HTTP2 over quick. So small changes, conceptually it's the same, but the implementation side differs quite a bit. And so the HTTP2 over quick, that is what we're now calling HTTP3. So it's not as big a change from what we had for HTTP1 to 2, that was huge, that was massive, very big change. But HTTP2 to HTTP3 is actually relatively small at the application layer, at the HTTP layer. It's huge at the transport layer or the security layer. Uh, yeah, I like like you had to qualify. It's not that different on the application layer, but yeah. lower on the stack. It's yeah, it's it's very different. Yeah, exactly. Um, so maybe I, I can do a little bit more uh, in, in, in detail. What that what that basically means, right? What, what does that mean that the quick is uh, integrated with TLS? And we have the second slide. Um, and what this slide basically shows is, is your typical um, TCP packet with a very long packet header with all of the metadata, like the sequence number and the acknowledgement number and uh, the receive window, that kind of stuff. And then in the TCP packet payload, if you're using TLS, you will have what is called the TLS record, right? Which is another encapsulation and TLS layer saying this is uh, TLS data that is uh, this long and it's encrypted, or, or this is the type of TLS data. And then in the payload of the TLS record, that's where you have the HTTP data, right? So it's nicely stacked in the protocol stack. And then below that, we have Quick. And Quick is quite different. Uh, Quick is, is encapsulated inside of UDP. Um, this is not done for any special performance reason or anything like that. It's mainly to make sure that Quick is, is uh, easier to deploy on the web. Um, because ideally what we would have done, if, if, if I go back to the previous slide, we would run Quick immediately on top of IP, right? We would have Quick as a direct sibling of TCP and UDP. In practice, of course, a lot of middle boxes, your firewalls and, and your uh, load balancers, they would bork or even your routers because they don't know anything about, oh my God, there is another transport layer protocol. I can't deal with that. And so what Quake does is just use UDP as like a substrate um, to build on top of that. And so within the UDP packet payload then is the Quick packet. And the Quick packet is, is functionally different from the TCP packet in that it has a much shorter packet header. So a lot, uh, the, the quick packet header basically only has a couple of flags, the packet number, and then a new concept, which is called the connection ID, which we'll get to later, probably, which is, is needed for uh, something called connection migration. But so that's all. Things like acknowledgments and flow control and uh, additional extension and options and that kind of stuff, all of that is in the quick packet payload using a new framing uh, setup um, in Quick, with the idea being that, that is more efficient because you don't need a, let's say a flow control update in each packet and not each packet acknowledges a previous packet. And so to save some space in the headers, all of that is delegated to the Quick packet payload. So you have a short header, bigger payload, and inside of the payload, then you have uh, a special Quick uh, frame type which is called the stream frame. And that is basically the thing that is going to carry your HTTP data, right? So this is core, this is important. If you're, if you're familiar with TCP and TLS, you will see that Quick does not use the TLS record layer. There are no TLS records. These are replaced by the Quick packetization, the framing that Quick provides you. So what Quick basically does, in, We'll maybe see this in a second as well, is it uses the TLS 1.3 handshake to get all of the fun stuff like keys and, uh, and uh, certificates and all that good stuff and, and uh, authentication that we get from TLS. But once the handshake is done, Quake kind of says, TLS, thank you. I don't need you anymore. Now I'm gonna do everything myself. So Quake just basically keeps just the encryption keys and then applies them uh, itself to the Quick packets. What this means, uh, especially in the diagram, is that you get um, uh, an almost fully encrypted Quick uh, packet. While for TCP and TLS, 
um, you would only encrypt the, the HTTP payload inside of the TLS record. And everything else is plain text visible on the wire. Quick, because it integrates with TLS, it can encrypt much, much more. It doesn't just encrypt HTTP data, it encrypts also almost everything else. The acknowledgments, the flow control, the packet number, and even some of the flags in the header is all encrypted on the wire. Yeah, that, that's one of the things I found really surprising where in um, um, HTTP 2 and prior, only the HTTP data is encrypted. Whereas with this, almost everything like the quick Mac, the connection ID, the checksum, destination port, source ports, those are the only things that are actually unencrypted. Everything else is encrypted. Yeah, exactly. And uh, there's two reasons for that. <laughs> One, <laughs> which will have a big impact uh, near the end of, the, of today's talk, I think. Um, two reasons. One, of course, added security and privacy considerations. That speaks for itself. But uh, I would say an even bigger reason or an original reason for doing it this way is to make Quick easier to evolve over time. So one of the main reasons why we needed to replace TCP is because we have a lot of middle boxes on the net that make certain assumptions about TCP. Like if you say you have a firewall and you're trying to deploy a new TCP option, a new TCP extension, and your firewall hasn't been updated to know what that extension does, there's a large probability it will, it will flag that as something suspicious, something that shouldn't happen. It will just drop the TCP connections using that extension, right? Uh, and it's not just firewalls, it's a lot of other middle boxes as well that assume certain things about how TCP should work and they start to break if it doesn't. And so what happens if you try to update TCP, which we've tried for the past, uh, let's say 15 years, <laughs> uh, it takes such a long time before anything becomes viable, before everyone has updated. And so the idea with Quick is, if they can't read it because it's encrypted, they can't read it, they can't misinterpret it, and so they can't mess up once we update Quick. And so a large reason for Quick uh, extensive encryption is to make it evolvable, to make it easier to change, because now you don't need to update all the middle boxes, you basically only need to update the client and the server. And maybe a few middle boxes in the middle that you actually want to cooperate with, like, for example, load balancers, um, as we'll also discuss later, right? So that is, um, that is one of the main reasons Quick does the uh, full encryption, and that is, I think one of the main reasons I think uh, you, you wanted to have this talk today, that has some serious implications <laughs> for yeah. a lot of different things and how to practically deploy and use quick uh, over time. Right? Yeah. So would, would you like to uh, discuss a few more of the, uh, the technical details or, or would you like to discuss the practical implications already or? Oh, I, we were just on slide three, so I was wondering if you were oh, uh, going to we, go we, uh, further or... We, we, I, I, uh, like I said, I, I don't think we need to go through all of these slides. This is, uh, uh, this is just like an overview of everything I could talk about, and, and especially for people later. Um, we will probably skip some slides, so go back and look at them, and, and there are a lot of URLs there that, that might give okay. you some more information. That, there is one in uh, slide nine, uh, that we can go through. And then I'll ask a whole bunch of questions with regards to implications. But uh, this one is amazing because again, for folks who, are, who may not be able to see it, it's the, the amount of round uh, uh, connections, the, the number of uh, yeah, client server connections to just make a full uh, 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 communication and showing HTTP uh, 2.0 with two, um, so that's four uh, handshakes. And then with uh, HTTP 3, TLS 1.3 for HTTP 2, that's three. And then with quick, um, it's only two. Um, so can you just sort of explain also you have two on the other side where there's only like a single handshake. 
um, yep. and that's done. Yep, exactly. That's that's one of the um, uh, uh, free benefits, I would say, or one of the side effects that you get from integrating Quick with TLS. Um, that much is that you make the connection set up faster. So the problem with TCP and the TLS stack is that you first do the TCP three-way handshake that costs you one RTT. And then depending on the TLS version you uh, or settings, you do one or two RTTs for the TLS session uh, setup, right? And then only then you can you start sending your, your HTTP request and get a response. So in the worst case, you're kind of waiting for four round trips to, to get any sort of data back. And the thing is with quick integrating the transport and the security uh, and, the, and the cryptographic side together is that they can do the, the three-way handshake, let's say the transport handshake and the TLS session establishment in a single round trip. So in the in the, the graphic, in the diagram here, this is this is uh, shown by having both the blue arrow and the, and the black arrow in the same round trip. While for TCP, those are two separate round trips um, that need to do these things. Because again, TCP and TLS need to be completely separate. You need to be able to function independently. Um, but Quick no longer has that problem. Right. And um, for a little bit more technical detail, let me go to a slightly different slide. Um, it shows us a little bit. So what, what Quick basically does is just, it, it sets up its own transport level handshake, kind of what TCP would do, but as data. So TCP doesn't send actual data inside of the true handshake, but Quick does. And what is that data that Quick sends? Well, that's of course the TLS 1.3 messages, and things like the client hello, server hello, and then, the certificate and uh, the finished messages, that kind of stuff, is sent as quick packet payloads during the um, the handshake. So they basically combine this into a single um, uh, round trip, which is uh, very nice, which is typically compared to a state-of-the-art um, TCP and TLS stack. So TCP with TLS 1.3 uh, and HTTP 2 then, it saves a full round trip. Basically. And so that's one aspect. And then a second aspect, um, which is not quick specific or H3 specific, but makes it even better, is, is called the session resumption and uh, uh, early data. Right? And the concept there is uh, very simply expressed, I would say, uh, <laughs> is um, you can't, you basically want to skip doing the handshake entirely. You're like, why do we need this handshake? I want to start sending HTTP data immediately, right? That's what you really want. You can't because then you would be sending the HTTP request uh, unencrypted. So anybody could read what type of thing you were requesting, right? That's why we can't do that. And the, the very simple concept to me is, is brilliant. It's just saying, okay, but if we have a normal connection, the first connection is, is normal. What if we negotiate cryptographic keys for the second connection during the first one. So that when the second connection is started, we already have uh, uh, cryptographic material to encrypt the initial HTTP request so that nobody can really read it. And it's, uh, it's more or less secure when it reaches the server, right? And that's what's called session resumption. So basically you resume a previous session with new keying material derived from the first. Uh, and that allows you to do that, right? And that saves another round trip. Yeah, it's deceptive though. Calling it resumption is slightly oh. deceptive because it's also chaining, right? You're chaining every connection with the key material for the next one, just in case if it fails, you can, or you want to resume, you said, okay, well, don't worry of the handshake. We've already sent you the keys, so you can just skip that process altogether. Yeah, basically. Um, and it's like, that's what I like about it. It sounds so simple, right? It's such a simple idea. And then that has ramifications that you cannot imagine how difficult it is to deploy this, this optimization, just, just to get this one RTT extra that, that requires so much work <laughs> to do this in a, in a secure way. Um, or in a decent way. 
but anyway, so that's 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 the concept, and that is a TLS feature. So you can do that with um, TCP as well. You don't need Quick and, and HTTP three for that. But the nice thing is because Quick uh, already combines the transport and the cryptographic handshakes, it allows you to send this encrypted HTTP three request in the very first RTT. Right over TCP, you still need to wait for the TCP handshake. Uh, and so it takes two RTTs, which is nice. But over quick, it's the very first RTT. So in one RTT, you do cryptographic and transport and application layer stuff in the very same first two initial packets, like kind of like reducing the, the possible delay to the minimum possible. Right. Okay. And that's that's what they call zero zero RTT. Yeah, no, it's really uh, it's really interesting. So, so let's talk of a little bit about the security implications right now. So, out on the internet, this looks really great because if I'm connecting out on TLS 1.3, it's all forward secrecy, so that I can um, attackers if they compromise the uh, public key. Uh, sorry, the private key of the uh, um, uh, server, they can't then retrospectively break the encryption and all the traffic that has happened uh, because of the ephemeral keys. So the question I have is then the middle boxes, especially like load balancers um, or even like security tooling, um, they would actually need to have active breaking and disconnecting, breaking and decrypting the communication back and forth. So the CDN, for example, like Cloudflare, would need to um, break the handshake and then to the origin, create another handshake. And internally as well, your system needs to be active proxying in order to be able to read the traffic if it needs to. Passive pro proxying will just simply not work. Exactly. Yeah, good. Um, the second part, so any any organization that is sort of depending on pass passive proxying, even if internally that they have the private keys and they're in charge of them, that just simply will not work anymore. So they need to move on to this. The second one is it's UDP. So, well, I'm, I'm not entirely sure about the first point that I that I fully understand you. From, from my understanding, uh, it, this doesn't change anything from the TCP plus TLS side. The, the basic concepts, I think, um, remain the same. Sort of. So I'll, I'll sort of explain on that side. Sure. So um, you're absolutely right, because even in TLS 1.2, there are forward secrecy uh, algorithms. Uh, what you end up in a situation is that um, sometimes those are also sort of the internal ciphers are not used specifically so that um, an internal uh, system can still do uh, passive proxying. What that means is uh, there is like a backend system that basically has the private keys um, for uh, servers and it would simply monitor the traffic and make a copy of the traffic separately and then asynchronously decrypt the traffic and monitor it. And I've asked a couple of people, why? Just do passive active proxy, right? Trust the certificate. And as long as you have a, tr a, cer a trust, you should be fine. The feedback that I got from some organizations are sometimes it's not possible in certain data centers and um, uh, environments. Performance, by the way, was brought up as one key reason um, between systems. And so they would do it passively so that they would not impact or interfere or put a middle box. They would just make a copy of the logs and uh, copy it asynchronously. My counter question is, well, why don't you make a copy of it on either end where the traffic is decrypted. But for for any for whatever reason, 
people who are still using passive proxying will need to actually make those changes going forward. It's it's the same it's the same problem you have with regards to TCP and updating TCP. No, it's there. It's part of the furniture. Do not touch it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But now this is going to be part of the new furniture, and something has to go. So this is a, one big important piece uh, that's uh, that's relevant. My second one is that it's UDP. So the networks can't just turn on or enable TCP 443. The new port is 443 UDP, correct? Yes and no. Okay. Yes and no. So um, the the idea is that, um, um, that there is no default um, um, quick port. That doesn't make sense because there's also no default TCP port, right? Uh, the transport layer doesn't care about ports, it's the application layer, that's one. And then two, HTTP3, uh, or should I say HTTPS3 then, because it's always S, uh, it also doesn't have a default port at 443. Like um, most deployments in practice do use 443. Um, we had a recent measurement study that looked at like all the current deployments and I think three of them like literally three servers use something else in 443 and <laughs> all the rest did it so in practice probably yes um but in theory um the server could use any port to do um hp3 and the reason for that that i think that some deployments will actually do that um is because browsers at least at the beginning will not be connecting at hp3 directly they will not be trying immediately to send UDP 443 packets uh, when trying HTTP 3. The reason for that is that um, uh, they can't be sure that the server speaks quick because a lot of servers won't speak quick at the beginning. And so what they will do is first do a normal TCP, HTTP 1 or HTTP 2 connection. And on that connection, you will get an HTTP level header, which is called Alt SVC. Uh, alternative services, which is uh, which is also shown at, at in the slides, uh, if, you, if you're watching the video, right? Alt SVC response header, and that basically says, okay, you, you've now used HTTP two, let's say, on TCP and TLS, but if you would like to use HTTP three, that's also possible, and you can do that on the same server at this port, right? Yeah. And so in the example, they say, okay, it's just this server port four four three, and that's what most people are doing. But there's no reason you couldn't give any other port um, in that in that setup. So basically, you bootstrap your HTTP three through HTTP one or HTTP two, or there is a, a proposal to do that via DNS as well. So that when you look up the the domain, get the IP back, not just the IP but also the HTTP three port. Um, that's something that Cloudflare and Fastly, I think, are already deploying, um, working with. So in, in some way, you get to know the HP3 port. That's what it comes down to. And then you connect to that port. And so I guess that some deployments will um, uh, not use 443, but most will, of course. And so that means that I think that if you want to open up a port in your firewall, you should probably be good doing UDP 443, just like you would do with, uh, with TCP. Yeah. Okay, I guess the, the reason why I ask is I'm just sort of ingrained in the old ways of TCP and the old, like um, in port scanning, so in some of the exams as well, they just teach you for 21 is for FTP, 22 is for SSH, and this is for this, this is for that. And um, the other nice thing about it is um, yeah, you can, in theory, put anything in anything, you know, anywhere. Like I can run an SSH server on port 80 or 443 if I wanted to. It doesn't, it doesn't really matter. But for convention, I guess, and also for just hardening the firewall so you don't open everything because exactly assumptions are the mother of all screw-ups and um, people make mistakes and they open up ports and services that really have no business doing that. And even with convention, they still do it, even against a lot of people's um, breaches and uh, warnings from security professionals on the implications. It happens. So I guess my fear and my question with regards to this is 
if it's, di I wouldn't say dynamic, but it could be anything. How would you basically set up an environment so that it's hardened so that it's only opening uh, a port, even if it could be any random port, it's only for the server's um, um, HTTP3 setup. Yeah, okay. Um, let me see, do, do I have a slide for this? Uh, I'm not, I don't think I have a slide for this. Um, the answer is relatively simple, I think. It, it, if you don't want to just open 443, but you also want to support new ports, and I'm assuming this is a firewall that only needs to open up for outgoing connections, right? Like from, uh, let's say, a company firewall with, with who wants their employers to employees to be able to go outside to any quick server, right? Um, so the thing is, quick, the quick handshake starts with um, what is called an initial packet. So the very first thing that you see is an, an initial packet, basically the, the TLS client hello or the TCP uh, SYN. That's basically the quick initial. And the initial is uh, encrypted in quick, but it's not really encrypted. The way they do it is they say, you know, um, there is a fixed salt, a fixed secret inside of the, in the, inside of the quick RFCs. And for each initial you use this fixed encryption key, let's say, right? So this means that firewalls and middle boxes that don't know what quick is, they won't work. But if you have a firewall with quick support, what it can do is first identify if an outgoing packet over a UDP port is quick. That is possible because quick has a, a few bits in the flags that will make it easier to distinguish from other UDP protocols. And then, um, once you have identified it's quick, you can then uh, decrypt or, or deobfuscate the initial, right? To get further information about what type of quick connection is this, to what kind of server is this going, basically what you would do with, uh, with the TLS uh, client hello inspection, right? Same concept for the outgoing packet. And then you can decide if you allow it. And then you can even say, okay, I'll allow it for now, and wait until you see, let's say, the, the reply come back. Because the first packet that the server sends a reply is also going to be a quick initial. Uh, an initial that the firewall can read. Okay, And then the firewall can still decide, okay, is this a valid connection? Is this something I want to allow on this random port that things are using? So this definitely needs a firewall that knows about quick, has been configured to allow this kind of stuff. But it is definitely uh, conceptually possible to do so. Yeah. Okay, and if I want to do deep packet inspection, it can still work if I give, for example, the middle box, give the browser or, or the end users a trusted certificate and then the middle box, the ability to create a certificate and man in middle the, the connection? Conceptually, yes. Um, there is there is no technical reason why you can't do that quick. Uh, practically speaking, it's difficult, um, at least with Chrome. So this is uh, for for people watching the presentation. Uh, I, I have a quote from some someone of the of the Chrome team on there. And so what Chrome basically has said, okay, we understand people are doing TLS interception and, and deep packet inspection, but we don't want people to do that for quick. Um, not necessarily because of any heavy handed security or privacy reasons, mostly um, because of the middle box problem that I had, I said before, right? They are afraid that people making the firewalls and the back and inspectors, that they will make mistakes interpreting what quick is, what quick does. And so they will uh, prevent quick from evolving Right? Because if you try to update quick and, and the firewalls aren't updated, then you have the exact same problem you have with TCP. So what Chrome says, it's the only browser that I know of, I, uh, the only browser that takes a stance, it says, you cannot use custom uh, certificates or custom root certificates or, or custom certificate authorities with Chrome if you don't explicitly set certain uh, uh, command line parameters. 
right? So you can do this for testing. If you have full control, you can add some command line interface uh, uh, commands there, and that will work. But it's quite a bit more involved. If you can see the slides, it's, it's like you need to take a hash of the certificate and give it the exact hash, and only that, only those hashes will be accepted, right? So it's it's more in, uh, complex oh, wow. than saying just ignore certificate errors. No, no, oh, no. <laughs> you need to know exactly what you're doing. So if you're a company doing DPI and you have full control over Chrome and you launch Chrome with those specific parameters for your intercepting certificates and all of that, then it will work. <laughs> if you do not, <laughs> then sad for you. Oh um uh chrome will just refuse to do quick uh, or, or complete be. the quick hash. Uh, now uh, sorry, that. i know this sounds bad right but the thing is this is for now <laughs> there is no reason to assume or they haven't made a strong commitment that they will always keep on doing this right they, they might change uh in the future but especially for now yeah this is i see this as a big problem um for me it's not as much a problem because I don't particularly like to deep back an inspection, but fine. Uh, for me, it's mostly like for, for uh, uh, local testing and, uh, and developer testing with HTTP servers, because there you also have self service certificates and it's annoying. But indeed, yeah. um, DPI is going to be a uh, pain in the ass unless Chrome changes this, um, this behavior. Yeah. Well, well it, it, it's from multiple places. I mean, I'm just laughing <laughs> for those at home, and I'll just read the, the the tweet. Quick uses a local store, but it fails the handshake if the root CA is not in the default set, which means that uh, they're not one of the public uh, root CAs if it's one of your internal CAs. Exactly. This was done by policy to prevent <laughs> antivirus software from man in the middle quick so we can keep evolving quick. <laughs> So I love that they did it because of the love of antivirus software, which I I I I I understand. But it means a couple of things. So forgetting about the security implications, if I have an IoT device in the future and I am forced to use Quick and um, uh, a Quick web server to connect to it, or my television for the first time, my router, my you know Wi-Fi router or anything. If this continues, it just simply will not be honored and it makes things a little bit difficult. Our intranet, for example, where we have to use a TLS certificate and it's an internal CA and all of that. And because I don't want to show the rest of the world all my internal domains and so on for Chrome for the interim period, I know because this is an interim thing that will not work. So I mean, exactly. who knows, right? I mean, this is an evolving conversation as to how this will go. But my concern is on two parts, right? The security defenses for being able to understand if uh, this is a packet that's going to com a command and control, this is actually um, um, a, a compromised system that is trying to communicate out to the internet and so forth, and um, maybe even try to block the, the traffic. That's some of the reasons that's put in, not as much as antivirus, but I, I get what they're they're getting at here. The the other part is just normal day-to-day -day internal certificates and systems that will still need this. So okay, only one browser is going down that route. I understand why they would go down route that for the general internet, but for internal organizations that would need some kind of inspection or even their own websites to work internally, their intranet, that makes things difficult. And actually for IoT and also for um, for you know hotel Wi-Fi connections or things like that, I would have actually liked it to go the other way. I'd like it to be easier for IoTs and internal systems to embrace uh, TLS uh, safer and find a way of actually doing this better rather than the other way or only if you're out on the internet, do you, can you uh, communicate and communicate securely? So it has another yep. implication there. I, I fully agree. I think the, the, the main sentiment there is, is not just with the Chrome team, but a lot of other people as well, is, is if Quick fails, that shouldn't be a big problem because you can fall back to uh, HTTP2 and, and, and TCP, right? 
And the assumption is that you will always run both H1 and 2 uh, next to H3. So you can always fall back to the, to the bottom one. So if people have antiviruses, they, want to, they don't want to give up, that's fine. They just can't use quick, you fall back to, to H2, which for most people won't break things. Um, it's, it, they will lose some of the, some of the performance optimizations, but uh, they won't actually fully break things, at least yet. I have one slide here, let me see. Right. Um, but if you look beyond just pure web page loading in H3, like you say, in interfaces for internal uh, devices, or they're talking about doing DNS over HTTP3 or, or SSH or similar things. Microsoft is doing Samba, SMB, file management uh, uh, over Quick as well. And those things might not have a very simple or direct mapping to uh, TCP that is as usable as the H3 version, right? Um, and so, yeah, it's <laughs> it's very difficult to get anything from the Chrome team about what their plans are long-term. I tried, <laughs> but they're very tight-lipped, but we'll, um, We'll see. Okay. Uh, you also had uh, some slides on tooling, which HTTP three. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. So um, the thing is, let, let me let me go back to uh, one of the first slides that we already had before. So this is again the slide that I showed at the beginning, where we compare how. Um, TCP is encrypted differently from from Quick, and if you if you are a security professional that does network analysis, you will know that even if you have an encrypted uh, HTTP trace, you can still do a lot with a PCAP because all of the TCP level stuff, uh, and also some of the TLS stuff like the record header uh, information, that is all just available. You can't see what's in the HTTP stuff, but all the rest you can basically just look at. Um, and so that makes PCAPs and, and Wireshark quite usable for TCP. For Quick, that is no longer the case. Quick all offers you almost nothing if you just have an encrypted uh, Quick PCAP. You won't even be able to see the packet numbers for individual Quick packets. The only thing that you will be able to see is it's a Quick packet, and this is the connection ID for that Quick packet, and that's that's about it. That's all you'll see from a normal PCAP, which means that um, you can use Wireshark. Wireshark has excellent quick support at this point, but you will need to have uh, the decryption keys um, available. So before, if, if you've done this before, you know the SSL key log file uh, uh, environment variable that you can use with browsers to get, uh, to get the TLS decryption keys like that, to actually look inside of HTTP encrypted traffic. Now you will need to do that for quick as well. So for all the connections, you will need to ex, ex, exfiltrate full um, encryption keys, conceptual, right? And that's a, that's a problem because um, those keys, they will not just decrypt the quick metadata. They won't just give you the packet number and the acknowledgements and all that kind of stuff. They will also decrypt all of the HTTP3 user data, all of the passwords and all of the sensitive uh, content that you might have, those will automatically be decrypted as well. So it's like an all or nothing approach when you do, uh, when you do the PCAPs. And of course, there's some serious issues uh, on multiple levels. And this, is, this has basically been one of my main topics during uh, my PhD on Quick and HP3 is how can we improve this? Um, the, the, the way to observe and debug Quake in a better way. And so the thing that we're working on now is to say, instead of using in-network packet captures and, and storing decryption keys, which you don't want to do, you don't want to store ephemeral keys ever, <laughs> right? Uh, instead of doing that is basically, I find it interesting what you said earlier on, uh, Sharif, is, is uh, why don't you just capture that at the endpoints directly? Right? Why, why, why do yeah. you need an in-net recapture? Why don't you do it on the endpoints? And that's basically what we're doing. Um, and that is, um, the, it's called the QLog project from Quick Logging. And the idea is that you will just log your, your Quick and HTTP3 level uh, protocol information without 
the passwords in the sensitive content, so just the protocol stuff, in, in this case, a simple JSON-based format directly at the client server. Uh, so you get immediately the, the necessary uh, um, debuggability or observability information you need from the endpoints without having to deal with most of the privacy stuff um, directly. And this is an ongoing project. This, this is not an RFC yet, but we're in the process. But this is supported by over 80% of all the quick implementations. Um, so most of the big servers, they, they output this format. If you configure it, uh, all of the browsers except Chrome. And for Chrome, we have an option a, a converter that goes from the internal logging format from Chrome to the QLog format. Um, that you can get that right. And then, yeah, you want a question? No, no, I was going to say, um, just remember, part of the argument is also um, performance. So the idea is that you have two systems, or actually a farm of systems that communicate with each other, even sort of on the same hypervisor, and you still want to monitor the traffic between those two nodes, and you want the minimal performance impact, which is why they try to do it completely asynchronously, which means that they don't put any loads. Um, so logging on the agent, no logging um, or um, in the middle, it's purely passively. But again, I don't have any data to say if <clears throat> someone with performance experience can show like the difference between uh, uh, the, the two, but not, not that I'm asking you to do more work. It's more of like, uh, I, 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 exactly, you know, uh, you have enough. Yeah, no, no, it's no. more of if, if some, uh, if I ask, like, can you tell me just like how much of a magnitude difference or a cost it is, then people would understand, but there is an alternative. You just log it when it's decrypted at the other end. Exactly, and that's that's a perfectly fine uh, critique of this method, right? There is a certain trade-off that needs to be done in terms of uh, performance overhead. Um, this system has been tested in practice. Uh, for example, Facebook, they have like a huge HTTP deployment. They are doing endpoint logging and, and exfiltrating this to a, to a database. Um, and they do see some impact, but it's definitely not huge. I think it's in the low single digit percentages. That they um, that they're calling. We did have a report from uh, another project uh, just this week who, who claim it's up to ten percent. Mm. So that's definitely not nice. I I fully agree. Um, but again, it's a trade off. It's a trade off between privacy, security, um, and uh, as well, if if you want to store the the encrypted pcaps, you will have to store the entire pcap. Um, so with TCP, what you can do is you can you can only store the first so many bytes of each packet and just drop the payload, right? Because you only care about the TCP header. Quick, you can't do that. You need to store the entire packet because the control data can be anywhere in the payload. It doesn't have to be uh, at the front. You need the entire payload to decrypt it. So you get huge, huge files. Um, basically files that are bigger than the transfer that you're doing over the network. So there are. Oh, I was going to mention another tool that you may not be uh, aware of, but um, are you familiar with Apache Drill? No. So this is a little bit like Presto, where it can query different data stores over SQL. So if it doesn't matter if it's Hadoop or so on, uh, the nice thing with Apache Drill is it, it's when written with people with security experience. So they do have a PCAP file connector. So you can query okay. large, massive PCAP files over uh, SQL, and it cuts through it like butter, which is really nice oh, cool. because it's based on the Dremel white paper. However, I don't know if they would understand, they would understand PCAP files, but they wouldn't necessarily understand, um, I guess yet, they wouldn't understand uh, quick, but as long as it's in the PCAP file, they should be able to query. So that might be another uh, thing to note, if Wireshark is just <laughs> dying uh, for one reason or the other, you might just run it through drill and uh, it'll give you the answer. Okay, definitely a good, uh, a good addition. I, I wasn't aware of that tool. Um, 
but yeah, obviously the pickup, it, it's not like um, I'm advocating for dropping pickups entirely. It's just, you have a mm. much, much clearer uh, trade-off to make than you mm. would do with TCP. And for some people, like for example, I, I mentioned Facebook. Facebook has been very adamant in saying that uh, in their implementations, they don't even have a way to extract the TLS keys. Yeah, There is no way to extract the raw TLS keys to do the PCAP decryption for their implementations. Um, they said, you know, if we add that, there is a huge probability that someday someone will be able to find a way to abuse that <laughs> or to unintentionally leak something like that. And so we'd rather not add it just to be sure. Uh, so if, if, if that's a stance you want to take, if that's a trade-off you want to take, then with Quick, it is now much easier than it would be for, for other implementations because QLock is already in place in, uh, in most of the implementations, right? So it's um, it, it adds another layer of what you can do with these, uh, with these systems. Um, and another system, for example, that has QLock support is F5, so the big IP. Um, yeah. systems they also have F F QLock that might uh, might be interesting for some of the um, uh, analysis and that kind of stuff right so it's just I, I would reckon this is yet another tool with uh, clear trade-offs to what you might be used to for analysis um, and uh, especially in larger systems you should look very clearly at those trade-offs and <laughs> decide what you want to do at scale I, I fully agree yeah. Yeah, and um, how they can um, manage or or troubleshoot networking issues. Well, if they have the the uh, enough signals, because what you've mentioned is some of those flags and so on are also encrypted along with the payload. So there are some things that they just simply will not see, um, and whether or not um, there's enough, uh, because. Remember, like you will end up with vendors who write crappy implementation or the network device is not necessarily as familiar. And by encrypting a lot of this, it means that there's little fewer margin of error. But if something goes wrong and you're not entirely sure why, you can't see anything outside of the the, the flags or the, uh, the components that the, uh, the fields, let's say, that the uh, network device sees, but not necessarily if there's a cuck up somewhere else that has to be troubleshooted and fixed. That is exactly correct. And that's one of the big, big challenges for Quick. So um, if you're a network operator for TCP, you can watch acknowledgements and, and sequence numbers, and you can derive round trip times. You can derive packet loss rates to a certain extent. Uh, and detect, you know, is, is something going wrong? Is it going wrong inside of my network? Is it outside the network? That kind of stuff. But Quick, you no longer have this information, so you cannot. Um, and Quick has, uh, it was actually one of the longest discussions ever seen in the IETF uh, for, for this, which is called the spin bit. So it's a single bit inside of the Quick uh, flags, one of the few bits that is not encrypted in the quick packet header. So it's a single bit, and this bit will uh, will flip once per RTT. So it flips from zero to one uh, and all the way around. And that allows you to, to a certain degree, observe uh, round trip times in on, on any place in the network. Um, and there are now uh, uh, proposals to also add what are called loss bits. So you don't just observe RTT, but you also observe packet loss to, uh, to some degree, but that's just a proposal that is not currently in Quick version one. Um, and to make matters worse, the spin bit is an optional feature. And so big deployments like Google Chrome, again, do not use that. Um, so the Chrome traffic is basically fully uh, unobservable in terms of, uh, of network operator perspectives for those things. Um, and that is, that is still one of the major, major uh, challenges that we face with Quick. And there are several proposals to make this better. I, I have some out myself uh, that use QLog so that network operators could request QLogs from uh, uh, server-side endpoints or at least redacted QLogs to get some of this stuff. 
there are uh, solutions by using uh, quick tunnels and, and transparent proxies for quick that, that try to keep that kind of state, that kind of stuff. But at this point, yeah, it's uh, it's hugely challenging, I would say, for an uh, for a third party intermediary to really try to uh, observe and measure measure quick uh, metrics. Absolutely. Yeah, that, it reminds me of um, a blog article that uh, Marlon Moxie Spike, one of the well, the CEO of Signal, the end to end encryption app. One of the things that he they they uh, consciously decided not to do was not to turn Signal into a federated model the same way as emails, specifically for this problem, because otherwise every server, every single client needs to update whenever you need to make a little change, like I want to add GIFs or sticker. Well, do I know if that other client is going to understand it and so forth? But unfortunately, this is a network protocol that is by definition is going to have to deal with these problems. So I find it interesting that they sort of halfway circumvented the problem by just, okay, I'll just encrypt the whole thing uh, or most of it. So only the, the network engineers only have to, I say worry, they have to worry about everything, but they, they can only see this much. So there's only so much that they can in theory cock up, but Give them time. <laughs> well, I can't talk to that, but uh, yeah. yeah, it's, it's I, definitely I, 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 an, a, a contentious issue for a long time. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I didn't mean it in a mean spirited way. I, I just meant like uh, anything that can go wrong <laughs> will go wrong. Exactly. So yeah. exactly. Um. Yeah, so um, I don't know how much time we have, but I, I had uh, uh, one final uh, topic. It's like some, some additional deployment stuff that, that flows from the uh, uh, security side if, if we still have time. Uh, yeah. So um, th there was also one thing I, I wanted to ask on the security side of things, but I don't think we have time for it. I can just send you the articles to look at because there were fairly recent types of attacks for HTTP2, and I was wondering if they're susceptible in HTTP3. Yeah. Oh, so, thank you. Um, yeah, <laughs> yeah, I added, uh, added a slide on that. So, so the talks you uh, the, the the thing you're talking about is very recent. It's it's um, it was uh, researched uh, presented at DefCon, I think. Uh, yeah very lot like last week. It's about HTTP2 request smuggling or a new form of that, I think. Um, where I don't, I don't want to go too much into details, but the basic idea is that um, if you have a proxy that uh, transforms HTTP2 on one end to HTTP1 on the other end, which is what a lot of CDNs are still doing, then if you abuse some of the HTTP semantics, um, you can you can get the, the HTTP1 backend to get confused and to reply with different data for different uh, requests um, that you sent. If that sounds weird, just Go look up the, <laughs> the research. It's very well written blog post and very good, uh, a very good YouTube video as well. But so the the, the main point that I want to try for, wanted to make there is that the, um, the the attacks there are not really HTTP two specific. They are HTTP semantics. How you deal with headers, how headers are uh, interpreted, and are, how they are transformed into different versions of uh, HTTP. And because of that, yes. I do think there are several HTTP tree uh, uh, implementations that are vulnerable to this type of thing at this point. On one end, because it's it's basically got nothing to do with um, HTTP two itself. It's just top level, and HTTP tree is still the same as top level. On the other end, uh, I would hope that big uh, servers <laughs> reuse some code, <laughs> right, and that they would reuse. The, uh, the high level HTTP semantic stuff. So if this is fixed for H2, and they are now aware that this kind of stuff happens and is dangerous for H2, they will also use uh, due diligence and, and justice in H3 as well. Uh, but this is actually one of, one of my new research projects that we just started, um, is, is trying to see if we can do this kind of thing with, uh, with H3 as well. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah, th Definitely. thank you for for answering that, it's perfect. 
Yeah, exactly. Um, I, I I do think that, um, so, so the thing is H3 has a lot of new code uh, because a lot of the header handling and stuff, there is a new uh, header compression algorithm in HTTP3, it's called QPAC, which is very different from what was used for HTTP2, which is called HPAC. Um, and so I do think that a lot of implementations will have some custom H3 code there that might be vulnerable, right? And so uh, that's that's why we started the research as well. Um, but so I, I think it's, it's gonna be very interesting times for this kind of attack uh, for Quicken H3 as well, yes. Okay, cool. Yeah, and sorry, I I believe I interrupted you. You were you had one more item to 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 mention as well. Yeah, it's it's basically the one that I I promised uh, to talk about a bit at the beginning, um, which is why we need the connection ID, mm. right? Um, so the idea is in in TCP, um, you, your connection is defined by the four tuples. Right, the two IP addresses and the two uh, ports. And once you change one of those, uh, your connection breaks down. So the, the, the typical example is called the parking lot problem where you are inside on Wi-Fi and you move outside to the parking lot and you, you disconnect from the Wi-Fi and you reconnect to the 4G. You switch networks, you switch IPs. Um, so all your existing TCP and TLS sessions have to be torn down or just can't be used anymore. You have to set up new ones because you changed IPs, right? And that's kind of what Quick tries to solve by using a connection ID uh, in each and every packet. So even if your IP address changes, um, the connection ID can stay the same. And so the server still knows, okay, this is the same client on the same connection. They just switched to a 4G network, let's say, and we can just keep everything going. Again, seems very sensible until it's like, okay, you keep this connection ID the same. And now anyone with a broad vision of the network, let's say a malicious nation state, can suddenly track people across networks, <laughs> across ge geographies, anywhere <laughs> based on their connections, right? So you yeah. really don't, you don't really don't want to do that. Um, and so what, what Quick really does um, is it, it uses uh, a connection ID for the, for the first path, so for the first uh, network. And then once it's encrypted, it will, it will uh, exchange sets of new connection IDs that it can use. So inside of the encrypted connection. And so once it moves to another network, it will start using new connection IDs. So the outside observer, they don't know it's the same connection because it's a new connection ID and they, they haven't observed the, the, the linkage because it was done encrypted. But the server, the other side, it does know it's the same connection. You get this uh, for free, right? Okay, so so just like the uh, connection uh, resumption with TLS, where it sends in another key just in case it wants to reconnect, it add it does the same kind of the same thing with the connection ID, where in the same first connection it sends in another SID, and the two endpoints need to hold them just in case something goes wrong and then they can reuse that other thing. That also tells me that the servers are going to hold a lot of information cached than they usually would yeah. in the past. So, right? that, okay. so the, that, that depends on how you generate the connection IDs. And I'll get to that okay. in, in a second. Um, so, um, because this sounds good, right? So we can do connection migration um, and uh, we have no linkability. That's what it's called in the quick draft, no linkability between these connections. That's fine. Okay, now let's deploy this with load balancers, right? Now load balancers, uh, the core concept is you have a load balancer, incoming connection load balancer needs to decide to which backend server it sends. And it might have like 50 backend servers. The thing is the same connection needs to always go to the same backend server for the entirety of the connection because that's where the state is for that connection. And the way that load balancers work for TCP is, is using like the four tuple, 
right? Because nothing ever changes in the four tuple in TCP. Well, guess what? For Quake, it does. And you might say, okay, then the load balancer just uses the connection ID. Well, it cannot because the connection ID also changes when you change networks. <laughs> so how the hell do you do a quick load balancer uh, that has connection migration support, right? And so that's, that's where it gets nice. That's where it gets interesting. So the first thing they do is they split up the connection IDs where they say uh, the client has its own set of connection IDs that it chooses. And then the server has a set of connection IDs that it chooses. Uh, that's mainly needed so the server is now in control of what the connection IDs look like. That's step one. The server can decide what a connection ID uh, has. Why? Because this now means that the server can encode the data it wants inside of the connection ID. Right? And so what that practically means is the server can say, okay, the first few bytes or bits of the connection ID are actually the number of the server. Uh, of the backend server that this connection ID belongs to, right? And then we have uh, even more bytes that can store additional uh, metadata about this. For example, if you have a server with multiple processes or multiple threads running, you can encode this into the connection ID as well, right? And so, and so, so the way that will work is if you have a server deployment uh, and, a, and a load balancer deployment that both use the same conventions for this, these connection IDs. Um, and the load balancer basically, even if the connection IDs change, the load balancer just knows, okay, the first two bytes is basically the server ID. And I just need to interpret the first two bytes and then I send it to the correct server ID, even though the connection IDs changed. Because the random connection IDs the server generated always have its own number up front. Does that make sense? Kind of. I'll probably need to rewatch this a few times <laughs> because yeah. it's the end of the call. But sure. <laughs> I, I I get that they put in something in there to actually solve the problem by making sure the load balancer knows yeah. which backend server to speak to, and the backend server also has the would assume to hold the connection ID. Exactly. And then it gets worse because you don't want outside observers to be able to interpret connection IDs. So then you have to encrypt your connection IDs, right? And it goes, the rabbit hole goes very, very deep just to support this. Um, uh, but the, the interesting thing is, so you really need to have um, a common configuration or even communication between the load balancers and the servers. And I think this is also a big difference between a TCP deployment and a quick deployment. And this is an additional requirement that you will have. Um, and there are no full standards for this yet. There are proposals at the ITF that probably someday will become standards. But today, this is undefined. It's, it's unclear how we're going to do it. But the final thing I wanted to say for this is that this is not just necessary and useful for load balancers, this could also be interesting for firewalls. Um, because like I said, the, the firewall can track quick connections because the, the connection starts with an initial packet, right? And an initial is somewhat decryptable um, if the firewall knows about quick. That's fine for the initial connection, but the moment the connection migration happens, so the client or the, uh, the client changes IPs, the firewall won't know that. The firewall will just, uh, the, the, there is no, the, the, the client doesn't send new initials. It's not like a new connection. It's just the existing connection that continues. So the firewall doesn't know what's happening. It suddenly sees fully encrypted packets from a new connection ID it's never seen before, right? What a normal firewall would do is say, okay, <laughs> I understand quick, but this is too far for me. I'm just gonna drop this connection. Right? Enough of this nonsense. But with this, with the same concept, you could have firewalls that cooperate with the server farm behind them, are aware of connection IDs that are being in use. And if it's a valid connection ID, they can, uh, um, how should I say, let it pass even after connection migration, right? Um, yeah. And this is like, I, I think we're running out of time. But just to make this point, this is one aspect. And this is for the connection ID. I had other slides that you might want to look at, which deal with 
uh, aspects like amplification prevention for, for um, distributed denial of service attacks, which is also in Quick. And then there is uh, um, what is called a, a stateless retry, which is basically a TCP SYN cookie, but for Quick, right? And all of these systems are in Quick, and they have more or less big impacts on how you would deploy Quick, or different from how you would deploy uh, um, TCP and TLS, right? So you've just got on the tip of the iceberg with the connection ID stuff and the load balancing stuff. It goes way deeper. I can promise you. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so. Yeah. Um, what I'm, what I'm trying to say, if, if, you, if you're planning on doing a, especially a large scale quick setup, uh, be prepared to take your time because it's uh, it's very much non trivial yeah. Yeah, it looks like it. I wanted to just uh, ask one quick thing on amplification attacks because I'm conscious of your time as well. But um, was that actually resolved or is that still an issue on how it may be deployed? Depends on how you define resolved. Um, so Quick is intimately aware, uh, or, or the Quick designers are intimately aware about amplification attacks, obviously. But they say uh, an, an acceptable amplification factor is 3x. So three times amplification factor is all we allow. So that's basically what Quick says. It says uh, anything you receive from the client, the server can send back only three times as much um, in the first flight, right? In the first RTT, until we have confirmed that the client uh, IP is not being spoofed, that it's not being used as an amplification uh, uh, oracle. Up until that point, you're limited to 3x what the client is sending. So it's kind of a, an implicit trade off between we want quick to work, we don't want it to be used as amplification factor. So 3x should be a nice middle, middle ground. Um, so if, if you're watching at the slides, there is an, an example on the left that is not what Quick does. That is to illustrate the problem. <laughs> if it goes wrong, <laughs> what Quick does is it limits this to three arrows. So the, the slide shows, I think, maybe 12 arrows. Uh, quick limits this to three arrows, let's say, um, uh, worth of data to prevent that. And that is shown on the right side. Uh, and then Quick has other features that allow you to um, um, bypass this amplification limit if you're doing connection resumption with the zero RTT and you're still on the same IP address or reasonably sure you're a valid client and so on and so forth. But like I said, uh, and that then comes with a lot of deployment issues as well. Uh, so, so session ticket encryption keys that you have uh, with TCP as well, they're back. You have replay attacks that you need to deal with um, and so on, right? So. Again, <laughs> let's not go into deep uh, to that. The people who have experience with this know what I'm talking about, and the rest uh, um, can can uh, can follow the links in the presentation to to learn more about. It's just that again, this is all very very uh, complex to set up correctly, to set up securely. Um, but the, the main thing is that the quick designers are not idiots. They, they knew what they were doing and they knew the trade-offs that they were making. And most of these problems have been mitigated to some point, uh, I would say. But do you agree or not is if it's sufficient? <laughs> That's a different uh, discussion, but uh, there. Yeah. I mean, the yeah. other thing is the internet will let us know. <laughs> we'll find out. Of course. Of course. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Because the other thing is, uh, if it's one endpoint that does three, then it's fine. But what happens if, you know, a DDoS hits multiple uh, and just taking advantage of the three, but at a larger scale um, and what, what the numbers would look like from that perspective? Again, like I'm happy that the, the level of thinking that they went through it, it's a pretty complex beast. Uh, so, um, but the the rewards are also really good. So, um, so yeah, uh, it's nice the amount of effort they try to put in there as well. <laughs> Maybe to clarify that, so so there is a way to even prevent the three X uh, okay. limit. Um, very similar to sin cookies. It's called a quick retry. Uh, 
uh, stateless retry. Basically, it's, it's like if you think you're under attack or if you're being used as, a, as an amplification vector, you just stop replying to uh, uh, connection attempts until the client actually validates that they're a, a proper client. The downside is that you add an extra RTT uh, to each connection coming in. So you're, you're, you're lowering performance end-to-end -end performance, but you're preventing a uh, large scale abuse of your amplification vector. And that's easy, like, that's something that can be uh, turned on and off. And that is something that can be done in uh, like uh, a load balancer or a, uh, a DDoS mitigation layer before the actual quick server, right? That so you can deploy TCP, TCP SYN cookies way before the actual backend server uh, ever gets hit um, to mitigate all of that. So again, yeah, they're aware, <laughs> right? This oh, yeah. was designed by people from big CDNs and all of that kind of stuff. So they they try to do their best, but like you say, only time will tell. But that's one yeah. of those very nice things about Quick, crucial things about Quick. It is very evolvable. If big problems are found, big attacks are found, it should be relatively easy to update. Should be, <laughs> right? Yeah. Yep. Yeah, and definitely at least testing it, right? Because they they can maybe test a lot of this and because they've abstracted a couple of it by encryption, then um, uh, the systems that on, on the opposite ends, they have enough control over that they can do some validation there. Yep. Um, okay. So yeah. I think that we've gone through the main stuff Right. The rest of the presentation is more in-depth uh, information that people can look at. If people have more questions uh, about this, feel free to uh, to contact me directly. I'm sure they will add my uh, my Twitter uh, handle or my email somewhere there. Uh, my email is also on the top of the slides here. Um, feel free to ask me questions. Uh, it's it's one of the favorite things I do, helping people with quick <laughs> with quick questions. If you have more information you want to know about Quick in general, I have a, a very recent blog post on the website smashingmagazine.com. Um, it's actually a series that does a full introduction to Quick and HTTP3, uh, not from a security perspective, but there is enough security stuff in there to, to probably be interesting. It mainly introduces the protocols and the reasons and, and some of the uh, features we didn't talk about today. So maybe that's interesting for you all. Uh, yeah, and, and well. for those yeah. and the, and for those who's listening, I can vouch for Robin. He does respond to people because the way that we managed to get in touch is me asking him questions over Twitter. So yeah, thank you very much, uh, Robin. So yeah, we'll put um, um, the the videos up. We'll put the slides and links to the slides uh, as well in the descriptions. Um, uh, for folks who are interested uh, to uh, continue going through this as well. And thank you very much for your time, uh, Robin. Oh, thank you for inviting me. Um, I really hope that this was useful for the wider uh, security community. I really think Quick is going to, and, and HTTP3 are going to be important topics um, for a long time, um, security and deployment wise. And so um, I think it's good to get some of this stuff out of there. Uh, now that things are being standardized, things are starting to be deployed and people undoubtedly have some questions. So uh, thank you so much for having me. Yeah, pleasure. Okay, have a great day. Bye. Take care. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye.